Welcome to this presentation covering age discrimination. We've discussed a lot of different categories of discrimination and this uh, category has many similarities with the other categories that we've talked about it, but it does have a few important differences. So I'm going to go relatively quickly over the aspects of age discrimination that are similar to say race and gender and uh, color discrimination, things along those lines, and focus on some of the characteristics that are a little bit different. So let's go ahead and begin. We're going to be covering these first four topics in this uh, lecture. We'll do an introduction. We'll discuss how the um, ADEA, which is the a federal statute that covers age discrimination, compares to uh, related or similar laws like Title VII. We'll discuss how uh, complaints of age discrimination uh, percolate through our legal system. And then we'll discuss that prima facie framework that we've talked about previously and talk about um, how it's similar to, but more importantly, how it's different than uh, other types of discrimination categories. So let's begin. Um, age discrimination is certainly a thing. It certainly happens uh, for lots of different reasons. One, of course, has to do with our culture. Another has to do with some natural aspects of the human condition, that as we age, we sometimes lose some skills and lose some abilities, and that can affect the work environment. And finally, with changes in demographics, uh, sometimes people might be seeking employment at later points in their life than perhaps they historically have. One of the most important things about age discrimination is that there needs to be an individualized consideration. We can't make assumptions that say, well, a 70-year-old isn't going to be able to do X. It may be that most 70-year-olds can't do X, but that doesn't mean that Bob, who is 70, can't do X. He may be able to do X. He may not be able to do X. We need to have that individualized consideration. Now, you might think to yourself, well, how is that different than all the other categories? I mean, uh, we don't allow employers to assume things about women and say, well, because most women don't have the strength to do this, um, that doesn't mean that Mary doesn't happen to have the strength. Or just because, um, statistically speaking, most people of this ethnic or this racial group don't have this skill, um, we can't assume that a particular person in this racial or ethnic group lacks that particular skill. You're right. You're right that those generalizations aren't permitted in those other categories. So you might say that's not really a difference between age discrimination and um, these other categories of discrimination. But I think one of the things that are different about that is that um, being a member of a particular ethnicity or race uh, might statistically mean that you're less likely to have a PhD or you're less statistically likely to have a certain credential. Uh, but there's nothing inherent in the human experience that says uh, that people in this demographic wouldn't be able to, just socioeconomic forces have made that a less likely uh, path for those individuals. But with age discrimination, it's just true that people who are 70 are not going to be able to do certain tasks, especially ones that require um, endurance and strength, uh, to the same extent that people who are, say, 25 can do those tasks. It's not a criticism of anyone, it's just a recognition of how our bodies change as we age. And so we're really talking about uh, people who, we, we are not being silly or ridiculous if we have a question mark associated with can, you know, the 70 year old actually be able to work on the shipping dock loading boxes all day. Maybe that person can, maybe that person can't, but it's not a silly question to ask. What we need to do though still is that individualized consideration. Sometimes what comes up is, is a discussion of, well, do we, you know, okay, I understand we're not allowed to discriminate against people who are 40 and older. That's the important age, 40. Um, but what about reverse discrimination? The reality is, is that reverse discrimination is absolutely a thing. Um, there are all kinds of unfair uh, stereotypes that younger people often experience. Oh, the, this generation's lazy, or this generation lacks common sense, or this generation, da 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 da, whatever the negative thing is. People have been saying this since, I don't know, the Roman Empire days. It's a common refrain, and it oftentimes can happen that somebody who's very qualified for a job say it 
22 is passed over for the job and somebody who's 32 is hired. That is age discrimination. But unfortunately for that 22 year old, it is not a type of discrimination that the law recognizes at this point, either on the federal level or the state level. That type of reverse age discrimination is perfectly lawful in Texas. Um, so there is no claim that it actually can be advanced by somebody who is not yet 40. Let me show you how this can actually play out. Imagine that you're 39 years old. You got a few gray hairs, you got a few extra pounds, uh, you're about ready to shop for those bifocals. Um, you're feeling some, some differences in your body as a result of the aging process. Anyway, you're 39, maybe you're 39 and a half, and uh, your employer really seems to like the youth culture, really likes to hire people and keep them in their 20s and maybe even the early 30s, but it always seems like there's really nobody in their 40s or 50s working here. Um, you're concerned that once you get into your 40s, they're gonna tell, fire you. Um, so now you're 39 and a half. Your boss comes in and says, you know what, we don't need you anymore. Well, why boss? We just don't. Well, am I doing something wrong? We just don't need your services anymore. Oh, okay. You, you're thinking to yourself, well, I think it's because I'm almost 40. I think it's because that I am almost an older person. They want to get rid of me because of my advanced age. So you might think under those circumstances that you would have an age discrimination claim because it's really not reverse discrimination. They're firing you because you're too old in their mind. They might have even said that to you. They might have said to you, you know what, in a few months you're going to be 40. You're just too old to do this kind of work, even though there's actually no reason why you can't continue to do this job given your skill set and, and the age that you're at. Unfortunately for you, until you have that 40th birthday, you have no protection against discrimination under the ADEA. Your employer can fire you when you're 39 years and 364 days old and they can tell you we're firing you simply because you're about to turn 40 and there is no particular legal protection. Now I've never heard that happening literally but in theory it could happen. So there is no protection against reverse age discrimination in Texas or under federal law. Having said that, I will tell you that there are some states that do provide reverse age discrimination protection. Uh, the one that I'm familiar with is Florida, but I know that there are others as well. Not a ton, but a few others. So if you happen to in your career work in other places or deal with uh, employers that have uh, various locations outside of the state of Texas, you'll want to be aware of the fact that reverse age discrimination can be a real issue. And it can get complicated if you're talking about people, say, under the age of 18, uh, in situations where the child labor laws might apply to those individuals. So it's definitely worth your time to do a bit deeper dive if you're working outside the state of Texas. Let's consider a scenario here. We have Bob, he's 22, so of course well below the age of 40. He's a security officer at Owl Security Corporation. The manager intends to retain employees who are older as he feels they're likely to perform better. So this manager has an assumption about people based upon age, a prejudice essentially. Well, poor Bob, he fires Bob because Bob is only 22 and replaces Bob with Larry, who's 54 years old. Under these circumstances, Bob cannot successfully file an age discrimination claim against his employer because reverse age discrimination isn't covered by the ADA. Now, is what the manager did smart, clever, good HR practices? Absolutely not. If Bob is doing a good job, why would you get rid of him? Um, but the issue isn't whether the manager is making a wise choice, but the issue is whether the manager is making an unlawful choice. Many stupid, unwise things are not unlawful. And in this case, Bob is out of luck. There are a few instances where employers can have mandatory retirement ages. They are few and far between. And so if you happen to be working for an employer, have a client uh, that has some mandatory retirement age, they definitely deserve some pretty strict scrutiny. Um, in the universe of those very rare circumstances where an employer is allowed to have mandatory retirement ages, in most cases, employers have chosen not to have them uh, for philosophical reasons or for maybe um, uh, 
you know, employee morale reasons not to have it. Areas that you will sometimes see them are in safety sensitive positions such as uh, firefighters or fire or um, uh, police officers, uh, positions that can involve, uh, you know, physical endurance and strength and um, kind of in crisis mode. Another can be highly compensated executives. Outside of those areas, there's few and far between situations where you can have mandatory retirement ages, and it's a best practice to avoid them whenever possible. Okay, so who is covered? I've already kind of given it away here. It's anybody who's had his or her 40th birthday and older. There is no upper limit. So if Bob is 105 and he wants employment, he can apply for work, and if he's discriminated against because of his age, he can file a claim. So this is one way that um, the um, um, Age Discrimination Employment Act is similar to all the other statutes. Um, we have situations in which, you know, a person, no matter what race they happen to be a member of, they're a member of some race, or many, in many cases, more than one race. And so everybody is covered. So that's something that is a similar. Uh, once you have 40, you're covered no matter how old you become. A difference, of course, is that while everybody has a race, so therefore everyone is covered against uh, racial discrimination and everyone has a gender, so everyone is covered by gender discrimination, not everyone is covered by age discrimination. Again, you have to have had that 40th birthday before that law kicks in. A difference, though, between age discrimination and the other types of discrimination is having to do with that aging process. It happens in different ways. There are people who are 40 and um, you know they look amazing and young and youthful and they could pass for 25. There are other people who have had their 40th birthday and they look you know like they're well into their 50s and they're having all kinds of health issues. And so it's a different process. Some of it has to do with genes, some of it has to do with uh, the activities that that person is engaged in. And so um, it, it's a continuum. We don't have that in the other areas. I mean, either you're a woman or you're a man. There's no womanliness or manliness. Either you're African American or you're a Vietnamese American or you're a Caucasian American. There's no, you're, you're more of that particular ethnicity than somebody else. You either are or you aren't. There's no gradients. But with age, there are gradients. We would expect somebody who's 40 to have somewhat uh, different physical abilities than somebody who's 70. That would be expected. Certainly anybody who is 40, if we track that same person, there's going to be some diminishment before the 70th birthday. Um, Another aspect of age discrimination, which is kind of different than the other categories of discrimination, is that age discrimination plaintiffs are often pretty highly compensated. And that makes sense because they've been working a lot of years, so they have a lot of skills. And in fact, sometimes the reason why they're subject to dismissal is because they are more highly compensated than perhaps other people. Imagine for a second that you have five employees. Uh, two are over the age of 40 and three are under the age of 40. Two of the three are in their 20s. They're kind of new to this career. The two over 40 have been doing this career for 20, 30 years. Who's going to earn more money? I think most of us would expect the, the people with more years of service. Now, sometimes the more years of service means that they are more um, knowledgeable, that they perhaps can work quicker, that they can work on bigger projects that have more uh, value. So they're returning more to their client, to their customer, I mean, to their employer. But that may not always be the case. For example, if I am a, a order taker in a telemarketing center, um, once I've done it for a few months, I'm probably not going to get that much more efficient. I'm probably going to kind of maintain that same level. So if I have been working there for 20 or 30 years, I may have a significantly higher pay rate than that person who's only been working there for, say, a year. But that other person is probably not significantly less efficient or significantly less productive. And because the um, older individuals may be the ones with more seniority, they may find that they are more subject to reductions in force and things like that. 
but generally they're going to be more highly compensated and in many cases they're going to be more skillful than their coworkers simply because they have those so many more years to accumulate that experience we already talked about individualized consideration and we've talked about the fact that skills decline as a person ages in many cases. So let's go on and let's compare the Americans, excuse me, the Age Discrimination Employment Act, ADEA, with other laws in this area. Okay, so what does Age Discrimination Employment Act provide? Well, it prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of age. And again, it applies to people at least 40 years old. So on your 40th birthday, you begin to be covered by that. ADEA, which is what it's commonly called, was enacted three years after Title VII. So we see here that the year for this law is 67. We know that, of course, Title VII was in 64. So ADEA is not an amendment to Title VII. I guess I should put Title VII there. It is its own separate law. Um, I'm not quite sure why it became its own separate law, but the fact that it is its own separate law means that there are several, uh, sometimes subtle, but sometimes more, less than subtle differences between Title VII, which we will examine in more detail. Um, we'll see uh, at, other at other points in time, we've talked about how sometimes the Congress went in and actually amended Title VII. For example, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act uh, that was passed in the 1970s was an amendment to Title VII. Uh, so basically the framework of Title VII is what uh, still applies to pregnancy discrimination cases. But the framework of ADEA is different than Title VII. So when we're looking at age discrimination, while there's a lot of similarities, there's also some uh, important differences. Sometimes people get the ADA and the ADEA confused. ADEA, which is the Age Discrimination Employment Act, you can see it's got this E here. And of course, the word age has an E here. So that can be a way of remembering this. The ADEA stands with the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's no E here, and there's no E in disability. They're both lacking the E. So that can be a way of keeping it straight. Um, ADEA covers employers with 20 or more employees. It does, it, so you have to have five more employer, employees to be covered over Title VII. Title VII's threshold is 15 employees. I'm not sure what the thought process is for requiring a slightly higher number. Um, you know, Congress is a body that you know, does a little bit of horse trading sometimes. So maybe um, in exchange for raising it to 20, um, something else was was provided under the idea. Um, but, it, you know, the, the idea might be that um, because age discrimination is less of a cut and dried scenario, perhaps you might say, well, it makes sense to um, only expect somewhat larger employers to be able to handle all of those subtleties, all those issues of, you know, the changing and aging workforce. Just like with Title VII, U.S. citizens employed by U.S. companies who are also working in a foreign country are going to be usually protected. We found that answer, as you may recall, under Title VII. The time that it doesn't apply when, when, the, when the worker is a U.S. citizen and the company is a U.S. company is when there is a law in that foreign country that prohibits whatever uh, employment that, that the U.S. citizen is saying is discriminatory. So for example, if it's in a country that prohibits uh, women having law degrees, well, a U.S. citizen who's working for a U.S. company who is applying to become an attorney for that company in that new country, under those circumstances, the U.S. Co US com company can legally say, well, we can't allow this citizen to be practicing attorney in the foreign country because it's illegal. What the U.S. company can't say is, well, culturally, that would not be considered appropriate. Technically, it's not illegal, but culturally, it's not okay. No, the law, Title VII, nor ADEA cares about the culture. They care about point to a rule in a rule book, point to a statute that precludes this. If there isn't, then the U.S. citizen working for the U.S. company on foreign soil is entitled to ADEA protection. Apprenticeships. 
are covered. This might be a bit surprising because we think about apprenticeships as things that begin a person's career. Maybe somebody in their 20s, maybe a welder or um, a carpenter or someone along those lines. Um, but older people can also become apprentices. So if an employer uh, is, uh, is limiting people who can be apprentices to people of a certain age, then that would be a violation of IDEA. Along those same lines, job advertisements cannot prefer or seem to prefer a certain age group. Certainly you can't publish something that points to a particular age preference. Even terminology that doesn't directly imply that you prefer a certain age, but kind of uh, indirectly apply are unlawful. For, so for example, yes, it's true that there can be college students who are in their 70s, but generally speaking, most college students are in their 20s or maybe early 30s. The fact that there's a few exceptions wouldn't mean that it's lawful to say something like college student. Similarly with recent college graduate. Yes, there are recent college graduates who are in their 70s, but the vast majority are in their 20s or early 30s. So we're looking for phrases that might tend to imply that this somewhat, this is that the employer is seeking somebody who is younger than 40. So that's something to look out for as you are drafting um, job notices and things along those lines. Now this doesn't mean that you cannot go to college campuses and recruit people. You can certainly go to those places because those places are very likely to have candidates that you'll want to consider for your employment. Uh, but when you're advertising more generally, say in the newspaper or on you know, monster.com or something like that, you'll want to spot, you will not want to avoid those terminology because after all, really do you care what they're doing during the rest of their day? Do you care whether they're going to college or they're you know, doing something else? Probably not. What you care about is what the skill sets are they, that you have right now. You also want to avoid pre-hiring inquiries. You don't want to ask questions about, well, when did you graduate from college or what year were you born or things along those lines. It's going to be irrelevant to the inquiry. Also, it's not relevant to promotions and demotions, how old that person is. This can come up because sometimes what will happen is uh, an older worker will say somebody who's 60 years old. The employer might be thinking, well, uh, maybe this person is going to retire in three, four, five, six years. We don't really want to invest a lot of time and training to groom them for that promotional opportunity if they're just going to turn around and leave us. But if they're planning on working into their 70s, then it might make sense for us to retain this person. And so there might be a, a temptation to either ask questions about retirement plans or to make assumptions about what this person might be planning on doing and saying, oh, well, we don't know this person's going to stick around, so we're not going to groom them for that promotion. That is not lawful. You should not make assumptions that this person isn't going to be around or isn't going to be uh, in position long enough to benefit the organization. Similarly, when demotions are being considered, the age of the person is irrelevant. Benefits are a little bit of a carve out. We'll talk more about this going forward about how benefits are going to work in this environment, but certainly you can't deny benefits to older workers that you provide to younger workers. Um, so for example, you can't charge a higher uh, premium on health insurance benefits to older workers. It's certainly true that it's more expensive to provide health care benefits to older workers than it is to younger workers. Um, and it's also true that an employer oftentimes is not required to provide health insurance, but if an employer chooses to do so, cannot provide those at a higher cost. Just like all the other types of harassment we've talked about, be it racial harassment, color harassment, uh, sex harassment, national origin harassment, age harassment is also prohibited. You may be thinking, well, what does that look like? Oftentimes that might come up when a person is teased greatly for their age, you know, called grandpa around the office. Um, everybody, uh, you know, wears black and they have black balloons when a person turns 50 or 60. When there's constant uh, jokes about old geezers and how incompetent they are, or there's constant suggestions about, well, you ought to retire, you're getting so old, that type of thing. Um, in extreme cases, that can qualify as harassment. Um, and so that needs to, uh, that type of playfulness sometimes is considered kind of fun in the work environment, but it's not fun when you're the recipient of it. 
<clears throat> and so that ought to be um, uh, something that uh, HR and the legal department work to make sure that type of thing isn't going on and isn't considered appropriate. Now, having said that, there's nothing wrong with celebrating birthdays and and milestones, and also celebrating retirements. But you know, maybe you know t the ten-year uh, milestone in employment, or twenty years, or thirty years. All those things are wonderful things to to celebrate, but they should be done respectfully. Retaliation is one of the areas um, that that is different than the other areas of, of ADA dis discrimination law in that somebody can be the subject of retaliation who isn't 40. So imagine that Bob is being uh, discriminated against because of his age. We'll say he's 57. Um, one of his coworkers is only 33. But that coworker testifies on Bob's behalf, uh, recounting some situations that that coworker had been present when Bob was subject to discrimination, or maybe that coworker is uh, offering testimony that Bob was a skilled and good worker. And so, in other words, this 33-year-old uh, is supporting Bob's account of what happened. Well, let's say the 33-year-old is subject to retaliation, perhaps terminated or demoted or um, that receives other negative consequences. Even though that worker obviously can't advance a discrimination claim under Title VII, he or she could advance a retaliation claim. He doesn't have to be, or she doesn't have to be 40 to allege that type of claim. We've already talked about the fact that Texas does have a statutory uh, protection uh, similar to the federal law. Uh, so certainly that can be an avenue for uh, plaintiffs to use, although I'll tell you generally, just like under Title VII, um, most um, uh, Texas plaintiffs are going to choose to sue under the federal law over the state law, but they can have a choice there for sure. The um, idea does not apply to the armed forces. So you can see why the carve out, carve out might happen because much, of course, of the work of the armed forces are about crisis situations. Um, and uh, as a result, many times our, our, our military is made up of even teenagers or men and women in their 20s or 30s where the re reaction time uh, is, is quick and the body is, is fit. We probably wouldn't want 70 year olds on the front lines of the battle. And so while there are plenty of tasks that um, older individuals can perform in the armed forces, um, it, the, the Congress apparently did not want to uh, kind of get in the mix and, and disrupt what the uh, Army and Navy and the other branches wanted to do in these areas. I said before that if, uh, employees of the state and local governments are covered, and that's true, but they are only recovered um, uh, in, they, aren't, they aren't covered if um, in, in those public safety type positions. So firefighters um, and uh, uh, police officers, for example, or rangers or, or people along those lines are not going to be covered. Let's talk about the bona fide executive type of position. This is another carve out under ADEA. And this provides that an, an employer can have a mandatory retirement age of 65 for the very highest people within its organization. The idea behind this is that organizations do need at the highest levels to have some succession planning. If you have you know, your CEO or your CFO or your very high people in the organization and someone leaves, without there having been an opportunity to plan for it, that can be very disruptive for the business. And so you want to be able to say to somebody, hey, you know, you're 63. What are your plans? What are you thinking about doing? Are you planning on staying here till 70? Or are you thinking you'll be leaving around 65 or whatever? And so once you know what their time horizon is like, then the HR department can, can start doing some job searches or, or grooming people within the organization for those skills. And so it might even be that senior executive kind of has a mentor, almost like an apprentice, who they are training to take over those responsibilities. So it is possible for those very small category of individuals uh, that an employer can have a mandatory retirement age. One of the requirements though, if, if the employer is going to have that, is that the pension be at least $44,000.
a year for that position. This has not been adjusted over time. So this $44,000, you may think about it now and go, oh, it's not that huge. Uh, and you're right. But when this law was, of course, passed, this did seem like a very big amount of money. And so at some point, maybe Congress will decide to increase this. I will tell you, though, in most companies, um, there is not a mandatory retirement age. And even for the few that are, usually the pension package will be significantly more robust than this. Another big difference between ADEA and Title VII has to do with the RFOA. That's the abbreviation that you'll commonly hear people talk about, RFOA. And that stands for reasonable factor other than age. For some reason, the T did not get in the abbreviation. Um, this is important because it's kind of analogous to business necessity, but it's not fully analogous. It goes back to that idea that um, the courts have been reluctant to be as demanding on employers in the age area as it's demanding on employers in the Title VII area. Again, because aging is a natural process where skills are lost, uh, there's the understanding that in, an employer uh, can sometimes be acting very reasonably even though uh, to some extent it may appear that age is being a factor in the decision. So as a result, it's much easier, I don't say much easier, but it's somewhat easier for an employer to be successful in an IDEA claim over a Title VII. And conversely, of course, there's a bigger burden on the plaintiff. Uh, the reasonable factor other than age defense that the employer can advance is an easier threshold than the business necessity defense that Title VII requires. Um, an employee is not barred from pursuing a claim simply because the employer treated another age protected worker better. You know, when we think about, say, Title VII in the areas of uh, sex discrimination or race discrimination or national origin discrimination, if you said before, you know, kind of a woman's a woman's a woman. An African American's an African American is an African American. We don't say that person is more womanly or less womanly or that person is more African American y or less African American y. You're either in the category or you're not. But with age, age is a different situation. Uh, to compare a 40 year old worker with a 80 year old worker, is kind of a silly thing. You can easily imagine an employer who doesn't discriminate at all against the 40-year-old worker uh, might even consider that worker still relatively youthful, but might be very discriminatory towards the 80-year-old worker. And so to lump those in and kind of say, well, yeah, we treat our 40-year-old workers just fine, so therefore we can't possibly be discriminating against our 80-year-old workers, uh, is not a, a reasonable or, or logical argument. And so there's a recognition in the law that this is not a, uh, a fungible category. Everybody who is over 40 is not the same um, in terms of how their employers may look upon them. So you might have an employer who treats 40-year-olds just fine, but doesn't treat 60-year-olds just fine. And that would be still qualify as discrimination in 60-year-olds. The employer isn't going to be able to point to the significantly younger people and say, well, we, we treated them okay, so therefore it must not, I mean, we must not be discriminating against the older workers. Let's consider a scenario here. So Mary is 59. She works as a makeup artist, and the company hires a new manager. Uh, Bob fires Mary and gives her job to Susan, who's 42. Well, Susan is over the age of 40, so she's also protected by Adia, but she is 17 years younger than Mary. And so you can see that there's a significant difference in how Mary will appear to the customer over how Susan appears to the customer. Under these circumstances, Mary may well have a valid claim, even though the person who replaced her is also covered by Adia. Now, if Mary were African-American and Susan were African-American, um, it's just not going to be possible for Mary to allege a race discrimination claim under those circumstances. Uh, given the fact that Mary's a woman and Susan's a woman, Mary's not going to be able to successfully make a, a sex discrimination claim. Um, because again, you're either a woman or you're not, you're either African-American or you're not, but the age thing does change over time.
we already said before that people in their 30s, even though sometimes in certain industries they may be subject to discrimination because of their advancing age, they are not covered by um, the IDEA. We um, haven't talked about the sovereign immunity area. We just talked about working for state and local governments when the person is in a safety sensitive function. But let's consider a scenario. Because unless the state has waived a sovereign immunity in these cases, the, uh, the state cannot be sued. So let's pause before, actually before we go into the scenario, let's pause and talk a little bit about what sovereign immunity is. When I see the word sovereign, and perhaps this is true for you, I think king, the sovereign. And we can even see in the word sovereign, the word reign just like a king reigns. And that's a, a pretty good analogy there for this term because historically a sovereign was the king. Um, and so we had this idea in the law of sovereign immunity. The idea was, it's kind of old fashioned, but uh, stick with me for a second. The idea was, well, the king can't violate the law because he creates the law. And so if he, if he let's say he makes a law that says you can't murder people, and, but then he turns around and murders somebody. Well, obviously, he was, by his act of murdering somebody, creating an exception to that law. His action is actually creating the exception. And so the idea is that the sovereign can't be guilty of a crime. He is immune from prosecution because he is the law. There is no um, secondary recourse that can exist. Now, in democracies like ours, the idea of sovereign immunity is not very popular um, because the idea is that we want our governmental leaders to be held responsible. So if we have a member of Congress who murders somebody or a member of the state legislature who murders somebody, uh, they themselves don't have the capacity to make an exception to the rule because they're just one voter um, in that particular legislative branch. They themselves can't cause the law to change. And we don't want them to be above the law. That's just not part of our idea. So much of these ideas of sovereign immunity have gone by the wayside. But there still are remnants. I'll give you an example. Um, Title VII pretty much applies to all employers who have over 15 employees. But until the 1990s, it didn't apply to one employer. And that employer was the US Congress. The US Congress was completely free to discriminate based upon sex or national origin or race. And there was no recourse for employees who were terminated or were not promoted or for applicants who were not hired. That law was eventually changed and now uh, employees of the Congress are protected, but it, it was a, a protection that wasn't enacted for almost 30 years after the initial law was passed. So under that situation, the Congress had maintained the sovereign immunity of itself um, in that area. And states, again, have the capacity to apply sovereign immunity in the areas of age discrimination and employment law. Let's consider how that might play out in a fact pattern. So let's look at this scenario. Larry's 57 and he drives a school bus. He has a good record, so there's no reason that any employer ought to be looking to end his employment. But unfortunately, um, Larry is fired and he, they, Larry is replaced by Bob, who is significantly younger. Because of this, Larry files a discrimination claim under the um, Age Discrimination Employment Act with, with the EOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. But let's assume that Larry's state has not waived sovereign immunity. Again, he works for the state. In Texas, it would be for the school district, which is a, a subdivision of the state. If that state has not waived sovereign immunity, unfortunately for Larry, he's not going to be able to successfully file a claim of age discrimination because he works for the state. Now, again, that only applies in situations in which the person is an employee of some branch of the state or local government. Another difference between IDEA and Title VII are the remedies that are available. We'll talk more about those in a later presentation. So let's talk about this case. This is a U.S. Supreme Court case back in the 1990s. Um, the issue that this case was considering is, can an employee file an age discrimination suit under the IDEA if his replacement is 40 years or 
or older. In other words, if, he, if his replacement was also in the protected category. And as we saw in this example, right here, the answer is yes. But there's going to have to be an age of dif uh, a significant age difference. If Susan is 58, that's not going to fly because, you know, an employer would not reasonably discriminate against a 59-year-old, but then not discriminate against a 58-year-old. But with an age difference of 17 years, it's very likely that an employer could discriminate against one without discriminating against the other. In the fact pattern in the O'Connor case, we had a 56-year-old who was replaced by a 40-year-old. So we have a gap of 16 years. And of course, the position of the employer was, well, the 40-year-old was covered by Adia. James was covered by Adia. So it's just like if we had replaced um, a man with a man or a white person with a white person or a whatever with a whatever. Well, no, this is, there's a material difference between 56 and 40. So age discrimination can occur even if the replacement is age 40 years or older. You don't need to know the name though of this case. Okay, so let's consider general, di general dynamics versus Klein. And the issue here is a more recent case uh, for 2004. Does the idea prohibit reverse age discrimination against workers over age 40? So before we talked about reverse age discrimination, we were talking about people who hadn't yet had their 40th birthday. And we said they were excluded from coverage. But now we're talking about a different situation. We're talking about two categories of people. Both categories are over 40. So this is the 40th birthday here. And an employer has set up a policy that treats these, the older folks better than these younger but still protected folks. That, so, so these people are in a better position than these, even though both groups are over 40. In that situation, is this unlawful? And the answer is no. In this particular case, the employer negotiated a union contract that provided better health care benefits for people who had already had their 50th birthday. In this case, uh, Mr. Klein was between these two ages, so he was over 40 and therefore protected by IDEA but not in the older category of people that were getting these extra goodies. And so he says, that's unfair. Whatever these 50 plus year olds are getting, I ought to be able to get as well because I am in the IDEA protection. The courts, however, did not buy that. IDEA does not stop an employer from favoring an older employee over a younger employee. And again, you don't need to know the name of this case, but you do need to know the idea of the case. Uh, state laws, again, vary dramatically in this area, although I think Texas is, is probably by far the, um, the most common, um, which is our statute in Texas tracks with IDEA very, very closely. Um, some states don't have protections at all, and then, of course, IDEA provides the protection. So really having a state law in this area that mirrors IDEA really isn't any better than or worse than, than not having a law at all. But as I said, example, the, the case of Florida, there are states who do provide greater protections. In other words, they give that reverse age discrimination protection for people under the age of 40. So now we're ready to talk about complaints about age discrimination. How does the plaintiff handle those situations or the potential plaintiff? Well, of course, most employers, smart employers in any event uh, of really any size are gonna have some kind of complaint process in effect so that the employee can bring it to the attention of the employer that the employee feels that he or she has been subject to age discrimination. An employer wants to have this process for really any type of discrimination claims. Uh, they're going to have that same process for harassment anyway, as we talked about when we were talking about sexual harassment. And that's necessary in order to successfully advance a farragher ellerth defense. And you're, still, you're going to want to have this process also be used for discrimination cases. There's nothing new about this, though. You're going to want to have this for age discrimination, just like all the other categories. Um, and of course, your uh, the employee can also file and should file with uh, the EOC. 
and make a claim of discrimination with that. Alternatively, the employee can choose to file with the FEP, Fair Employment Practices, a state agency. A lot of times these agencies are called five, excuse me, 706 agencies. Uh, we have one in Texas. Um, and so as a result, that's one of the reasons why in Texas you have 300 days to file claims versus 180 days. So that's uh, this, the employee's second choice. And this is not either or, this is and. Uh, an employee probably, most employees are probably going to find they're going to want to do this first. Of course, if they're up close against the statutory period, they're going to want to do this as well. Because whatever one does here does not toll or stop the ticking of the statutory clock. You still have to be concerned about the deadline. So if you're the employee and you're sitting back there thinking, oh, you know what, they're investigating my concerns and it seems like they're going on and on and on forever, well, they might be doing that to trick you to make you inadvertently miss the deadline for proceeding in this case. It's not um, an either or situation. An employee can advance a claim under the EOC and also file a claim under whatever the state law protections are. So the employee doesn't have to pick one or the other. Now the employee can't cover, recover twice, can't get double the damages. Um, at the end of the day, they're just gonna be entitled to one recovery. He, Big difference between ADEA and Title VII, though, is that under ADEA, the employee doesn't have to get that right to sue letter before he or she can proceed. All he or she has to wait is 60 days. Now, of course, if the employee gets the right to sue notice before 60 days, the employee can go forward and file the claim. But he doesn't have to wait. So again, we talked before about how ADEA is not an amendment to Title VII. So we've already seen two instances in which ADEA has some different kind of quirks or tweaks to it over what Title VII has. Title VII, you only need 15 employees. ADEA, you need 20. And here's the second quirk. Under Title VII, the employee has to wait for that right to sue letter before he or she can file. Under ADEA, has to file, but doesn't have to get that right to sue letter. It only has to wait 60 days. So those are two big differences. Now we're going to talk about the prima facie case uh, framework that we have under ADEA. And we're going to compare and contrast with the Title VII process, too. So to make a prima facie case, this is going to sound very, very similar <laughs> to what we talked about before. The first thing the plaintiff has to prove is that he's in a protected category. Uh, just like under the traditional prima facie case that we see under you know, a race claim or a gender claim, claim or a religious claim or whatever, you have to prove you're a member of some category. Well, not surprisingly, you have to prove you're a member of some category here too. You have to prove you're, uh, have, you've had your 40th birthday. I mean, that's almost never in dispute. This isn't something that highly gets litigated. Um, so, you know, the, yes, you have to prove it, but honestly, you don't have to, like, call in the obstetrician who uh, delivered you at the hospital or, you know, anything along those lines. You have to typically, you know, have your mother testify as to, you know, the date that you were born. Usually this is not something that is going to be contested. The next thing you have to prove if you're the plaintiff is that you were qualified for the job. Again, this is another requirement that is part of all the prima facie cases that we've talked about. And usually this is also not uh, controversial because and it's really not controversial typically in cases where you are demoted or you are terminated because after all, you got this job somehow, so presumably you were qualified. I mean, every now and again, you might have a case in which the qualifications for the job has significantly changed, and maybe this person is no longer qualified, but that's a pretty rare scenario. Now, if this is a failure to hire case or a failure to promote case, sometimes qualifications can be an issue. But still, I would tell you that this is usually not a big source of dispute. Usually, this is something that's going to be pretty easy for the plaintiff to prove. The third one is also usually very easy for the plaintiff to prove, that he or she was adversely affected by the decision. Well, if you're not hired, guess what? You're adversely affected. You're not getting paid. If you're fired, guess what? You're adversely affected. You're not being paid. If you're demoted, guess what? You're being paid less or you're having a less prestigious job. You've been harmed. If you're not promoted, you're, you've been harmed. So usually this is not a controversial uh, thing at all. So most of the time in the prima facie case situation, 
you're going to be able to prove, if you're the plaintiff, you're going to be able to prove this very quickly. And again, all of these are the same things you'd have to prove under any prima facie case, race, national origin, gender, religion. These are all uh, the same things. This last one is also very similar to what we have in the other prima facie case categories. The employer sought or retained someone else with similar qualifications to perform the job, and that person was significantly younger. And again, we're looking at six or more years. Let's go back to our case that we were looking at it before here. In this case, we had a 16 year gap. And so this was, was uh, so the O'Connor case kind of points to the fact that a 16 year, old, 16 year gap is a, a, a reasonable gap for, to, to find there could be discrimination. Uh, the case law is, is um, probably more in the six to 10 year case. You don't have to have all the way up to 16. But there is some subjectivity here. I mean, if there's only six years, sometimes it can happen that the person who's six years older actually looks younger, actually is more fit than the person who's, uh, I'm assuming the person who's six years older can be more fit, more attractive, less gray hair than the person who's six years younger. In that case, it's going to be harder for the, uh, the, the plaintiff, the older plaintiff, to successfully prove age discrimination. I'm not saying it's impossible to do it under those circumstances, but visuals start making a difference here. And so that's why there's kind of a range. There's a more fact-intensive examination. Obviously, it's better for your case, if you're the plaintiff, if the gap is more than six years. The longer the gap, the stronger your case is. And this is a difference than we've seen in Title VII because usually it's an on-off switch. I mean, if, if I'm um, an Asian American and I was replaced by a Caucasian, that's an on-off switch. This is a person in a different race, so therefore I've been successful. Um, it, it's, it's not a matter of degree like we have with years. So that's one distinction between a D and Title VII. Now we're gonna talk about that reasonable factor other than age. We kind of touched on that a little bit before, but um, let's uh, keep in mind that the burden remains on the claimant. Here we're talking about the plaintiff, so I think plaintiff, to establish an absence of a reasonable factor other than age. Traditionally, when we talk about the prima facie case, once the plaintiff has proven the prima facie case, in the past we've talked about the burden flipping, and now it's on the the employer to prove that there was a uh, you know uh, a non-discriminatory uh, reason that was going on. It's on the employer to rebut, and then once the employer comes forward with something, then the plaintiff has to show it was a pretext. So there's a back and forth. Initially, the plaintiff has the burden of proving the prima facie case then the defendant has to come back and, and give a reason that was non-discriminatory, and then the plaintiff comes back one more time with pretext. The ultimate burden always remains the plaintiff, but there is this kind of back and forth, you know, ping pong ball effect. But we don't see that ping pong ball effect in the area of age discrimination. The burden always stays with the plaintiff. Now you may think, well, how significant is this burden? Um, it, it certainly has some significance, but I don't want to blow it out of proportion and make it seem more uh, legally significant than perhaps it is. Um, the burdens that we see in the law are three. One thing we have is the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. I'm going to just call it the BRD. We only see that in criminal cases. Um, when somebody is charged with a crime, even if the jury thinks, yep, he or she probably did it, but there's still some doubt, some reasonable doubt. The jury is instructed to acquit that person, even though probably they did it. The idea is we would rather that we uh, release some people who are guilty than we incarcerate people who are actually factually innocent. So we want to err on the side of liberty, and that's the um, beyond a reasonable doubt st standard. But again, it only applies to criminal cases. 
Then we have our lowest standard, which is a preponderance. I'm gonna actually write this one out because this one is relevant really to everything that we do in this course because we're not in a criminal context. So preponderance of the evidence. And this is something that the plaintiff bears. That's a, a characteristic of our system because of course the plaintiff is the one with the beef. The plaintiff is the one that wants to overturn the status quo, whatever's already happened. And so we require that the plaintiff bear this burden. But it's a pretty modest burden. It, the burden is just more likely than not. So a true tie where the jury says, look, we don't know whether it happened this way or not. I mean, we're, we're, we're completely, you know, indifferent or uncertain about whether the plaintiff's story is right or the defendant's story is right. There's a tie, in other words. Okay, tie goes to the defendant. Now, obviously, if the plaintiff has proven the story so that the jury thinks, we think the plaintiff's version is more likely than the defendant's, plaintiff wins. If the defendant has proven that it's more likely it happens the way the defendant says it happened, defendant wins. But in a pure tie, jury just can't lean one way or the other. Tie goes to the defendant. So you can see it's a relatively modest burden of proof. We have the preponderance of the evidence standard. And that's the one that controls in this situation. There's a third standard which is called clear and convincing evidence. It's not something we're going to talk about in this class, but I want, in the, in the purpose of being complete, I'm going to share this with you. Sometimes people get confused about the standard and they say, clear and convincing evidence, that sounds like the kind of evidence you want in any case, right? And you do want it in any case, but it's actually a standard of evidence. Um, it's not just a description of the type of evidence that you want. So I'm going to list it here just kind of for FYI purposes. It is relevant in some civil cases. It even has some relevance in the criminal context. Uh, but again, we are not going to directly be dealing with this particular evidentiary standard in this case. So I'm just kind of offering it to you as to contrast it with the others. Okay, so we're going to co contrast the reasonable factor other than age, um, uh, the, the RFOA that we have in age discrimination to the Title VII rule. It is the defendant who has to establish a non-discriminatory motive. Because again, we thought about that burden shift. So now once the prima facie case has been proven, the defendant has to come forward and, and bear that burden of proof on the non-discriminatory reason. But now with um, RFOA, the burden remains on the claim, claimant to prove there isn't one. There isn't the burden sh shifting that we've seen under Title VII. So that's another uh, big distinction. So the reasonable factor other than age defense includes any requirement that does not have an adverse impact on older workers, as well as those factors that do adversely affect this protected class but are shown to be job related. So if you were to have an, a vision requirement, for example, obviously as we age, our vision diminishes, that's nature. Um, and so if you have a vision requirement, you're gonna have more people who are 70 failing than you will have 25 year olds failing. But as long as you can show that it really is legitimately job related, under those circumstances, that would be an RFOA, even though it may result in some employee, employees losing their jobs simply because of the natural aging process. The OC has issued a final rule in this area. And again, these rules um, are given some weight by the courts. Uh, EOC doesn't have perhaps the highest level of deference uh, that the courts have given it. Uh, so the, the courts don't always adopt the EOC's final rules, um, but certainly, you know, it's a, if it's, especially if it's a fact that flavors you, uh, you'll want to cite the final rule and that it, it provides more, more clarity, more definition about what an RFOA might be. If you're on the other side, if you're the employer and you don't like what the final rule says, for example, just know that courts don't automatically adopt and agree with what the OC does in a particular area of discrimination law. Let's consider a couple of scenarios. Okay, so we have these two businesses, they've merged into Buffalo Foods. 
as oftentimes unfortunately happens in this situation, there's some uh, reductions in force and unfortunately Bob has been affected. Uh, he's 51 years old. He thinks he was laid off because of his age. But unfortunately for Bob, Buffalo Foods, his new employer is going to be able to defend the claim of age discrimination if it can provide a reasonable factor other than age for Bob's termination. And one of them might be, you know, market efficiencies. Um, we don't need two production managers. Um, now that we have uh, merged, the other guy or woman was better at the job, and we decided to keep that person and get rid of Bob. That would be a reasonable factor in an age, and Bob is going to have to prove that um, that there wasn't a reasonable factor of an age instead of Buffalo Foods being uh, required to make that proof. Let's consider the second scenario. Bob has worked for his company, Stork Incorporated, for 35 years. He loads trucks, drives trucks, and delivers items to the recipient. He's 60, and unfortunately, he was recently fired. He's alleging age discrimination. But his former employer will prevail if it can show that Bob no longer has 20-20 vision and that that vision level is required to safely operate the trucks. It's not Bob's fault he doesn't have 20-20 vision. He's 60. Many times it's not possible to correct vision to 2020 when you as you age. So no, it's not his fault. He's not to blame. He didn't do anything wrong. But if this is a reasonable factor other than age for this particular position, then Bob is unfortunately going to be out of a position, even though he can't be discriminated against directly because of his age. Again, this would be an example of individualized evaluation. They can't just say, you're 60, most 60-year-olds 60 can't get their vision corrected in 2020. No, they have to actually give Bob a vision test. And if Bob doesn't have 2020 vision, that's when they can act. If this is a reasonable factor other than age for this particular position. And again, Bob is going to have to show the absence of the RFOA. The burden remains on Bob, unlike what we saw in Title VII circumstances. Let's talk about gross. I've kind of already talked about gross at this point. Um, so uh, this is this uh, where, where we get the, um, uh, the the lack of burden shifting. You know, the, the, obviously we saw the burden shifting in Title VII. We don't have the burden shifting in the age discrimination case. Well, why don't we? Well, it's not because of wording in ADEA itself. It's because of what the courts have done with ADEA. The courts have interpreted ADEA not to require that burden shifting in the case that has, you know, kind of led that charge is the gross decision. Um, so again, we don't have that burden shifting that we talked about before. Um, age does not need to be the only factor considered in an employment decision or to establish employee liability, but it has to be the but for cause. So imagine that an employer has um, an employee uh, who has been late to work 20 times in the last three months. And typically this employer fires people once they've been tardy 15 times. They have a clear record of addressing tardiness by termination. There's also some emails back and forth where some of the emails indicate um, a concern about this person's age. This person is, we'll say, 63. And there's some comments that say, the old geezer can't seem to come to work on time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there does seem to be some discrimination. But it also appears that given this company's consistent practice of terminating people who are tardy to work on a regular basis, that the employer, even without the, the age animus, would have still terminated this person. So the age is not the true cause of the termination. It's the, the series of tardies. And so under those circumstances, the person, the 63-year-old who was fired, is not going to be able to successfully advance an age discrimination case. We don't see what we call true mixed motive cases under Title VII as a result of gross. Um, uh, not in the way that we see them under Title VII. So again, it's another one of those areas where we see an advantage for the employer under age discrimination in comparison to Title VII. And again, that tracks back to the fact that it's a separate law. So there's separate kind of wrinkles with respect to that. Uh, when a claim is pretextual, and whenever we see the word pretext, what we mean is 
the reason given isn't the true reason, that there's another underlying motive for it. And many times the underlying motive may be an unlawful motive, such as age discrimination. So to prove that an offered reason is pretext, and it was offered by the employer, for the actual case of discrimination, the employee does not need to show that age was the only factor motivating the employment decision. So it could be that, yeah, I mean, for example, going back to my example, let's say that this particular employer always fires people after the 10th tardy. Uh, Bob, 63, and he was fired on his eighth tardy. Um, and then there's some indications that the employer just doesn't like people of that age working for them. Certainly, the employer uh, considered and weighed the tardies as well. If Bob had had, you know, no tardies or one or two tardies, the employer probably wouldn't have fired Bob. But he did have a significant number, close to the number in which the employer routinely fires people, but still less than that number. And so while certainly the tardies was a factor in the decision, uh, age also seems to have been a factor in the decision as well. Again, we, are, we still have the Title VII burden shifting mixed motives analysis that we talked about uh, previously. And here's that gross decision. The Supreme Court held that it is the plaintiff who must prove that age was the actual or but for, but for cause of the employee's action. There is no back and forth burden shifting. Mixed motive cases, not going to fly under a DIA. Even when the employee produces some evidence that age was a motivating factor, the employer doesn't have to prove it would have taken the same action regardless of age. So this decision increases the burden of proof that the plaintiff has to have and unless that of the employer. But keep in mind, again going back to those three levels, it didn't change the standard from preponderance of the evidence. That remains the standard for all discrimination cases. If you have an interest in hearing more about the gross decision, you can click on this link and watch a, uh, a, a kind of a summary of the uh, decision that the US Supreme Court presents. It's about a five minute long presentation. You might find it help, helps you to uh, make sense of the, the case in a little bit more uh, specificity. And they're also rather interesting to, to listen to. So I recommend that to you. You do not, however, though, need to know the name of this case, but you do need to understand the decision. Where there is direct evidence of discrimination, proof of pretext is not required. So when you have a smoking gun, when you have evidence that says um, that, yes, we're just, we want to let Bob go because he's too old, um, there is no need to uh, uh, prove that that other reasons were pretext because it's pretty obvious that the direct evidence is showing that the pretext exists. Let's consider Hazen. Hazen is a big case in this area. It's another U.S. Supreme Court case. Um, this was a reductions in force case. I'm going to tell you something. This is from the practical standpoint. Uh, whether you're an HR professional or someone who works in the legal office, uh, where em employers um, might be involved in reductions in force. Um, well, first of all, if you're a big employer, there's going to be reductions in force routinely. That's just the deal in our economy. Uh, for good, bad, or indifferent, you, you, people can have differing perspectives on it. It's just the reality. There's going to be reductions in force. Even employers that are doing well economically pretty routinely do these. Sometimes they're uh, strategic and they're very narrowly focused. Sometimes they're because there's been some bad numbers and people have to go. And so they're much more broad based. But whatever they are, you're going to deal with them pretty routinely in the HR legal function. And probably the biggest concern about RIFs, reductions in force, is the impact it has on the older workforce. Uh, yes, it can definitely negatively impact minorities and women, and so you want to do statistical analysis to demonstrate, or hopefully for the employer to demonstrate that the impact is not severe. 
but almost always the impact will be severe with older workers. It's just very unlikely statistically you aren't going to be affected by that. Um, so I just wanted to prep you for that. Be aware that uh, RIFs are probably one of the greater uh, areas of concern for ADEA. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court held that there is no disparate treatment under ADEA when the factor motivating an employer is some factor other than the employee's age. So there is no disparate treatment under that scenario. Let me kind of make that more clear what we're talking about. In this case, um, the employer considered years of service. Now you might think, well, isn't years of service kind of the same thing as age? I mean, if I have 30 years of service, I'm not 20 years old, right? I'm not even 30 years old. I'm not even 40 years old. I mean, you know, I, I guess, you know, maybe I could be as, as young as 46 if, you know, I, I had worked, you know, maybe at the age of 16. Um, but probably I'm older than that. And so um, as the number of years of service grows, it's almost requirement that age is also growing. Now, of course, in the lower range, say 10 years of service, yeah, you can have people who are in their 20s who have 10 years of service, and you can have people in your 70s that have less than 10 years of service. But when the numbers get really high, it's a pretty good predictor of age. Um, so you can see how when um, there was a, 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 a program in place that treated people with more years of service, um, disadvantageously you could say well that is going to have a disparate impact on older workers it might be a facially neutral policy but the impact is going to negatively impact that group the older workers more significantly than the younger workers and we've talked about this in the Rawlinson case when we were dealing with gender you may recall in that case a woman who weighed under 120 pounds was denied a position as a prison guard um, and her position was well you know, there's not, there, there's a fair number of women who are under 120 pounds, but there's a relatively small number of men who are uh, adult men and who are under 120 pounds. So this policy has a disparate impact upon women insofar as it's going to make it less likely for women to be hired than men for this particular position. And of course, the U.S. Supreme Court came back and said, well, yeah, that's true. And so because it has a disparate impact, the employer is going to have to prove that there's some kind of business necessity associated with this particular requirement, which requires that you validate it. You can't just kind of rely upon a quote unquote common sense idea that you might say, well, kind of common sense tells us that you need to have some size in order to be a prison guard. Well, if common sense tells you that, then you ought to be able to pretty easily develop the statistics that will show it mathematically that that's necessary. Anyway, that's what the Supreme Court said. So this is the issue that we're seeing in Hazen is, are, are we going to apply that same Title VII disparate impact logic to the IDEA situation? And it appeared after Hazen in 1993 that no, we weren't going to. Now, Hazen did not categorically say this, but they did say this isn't, uh, years of service is not the same thing as age. This is the actual language. An employer does not commit discriminatory treatment under IDEA by firing an employee, sorry, typo there, whose pension benefits are about to vest when vesting is linked to the employee's years of service. In other words, years of service is not a stand-in for age. It's not a disparate impact issue. Now, just to let you know, by the way, that firing someone right before they vest could well be an ERISA Section 510 violation. So just because it's not an idea violation under these facts, it doesn't mean that the employer is necessarily off the hook. Again, we have one of those OEA here that you can listen to the Hazen case in more detail. This is pretty grim for those uh, employ employees who are uh, thinking about advancing claims of disparate impact discrimination. It looked like the U.S. Supreme Court was just going to close that door entirely. But that's not what happened. A few years later, the U.S. Supreme Court found that a disparate impact claim can exist under ADEA. Now, in that particular case, again, here's another OYA that you can go watch it, it found that, no, these facts in this particular case don't actually satisfy the requirements, but it's conceptually possible. So we'll have to see where this develops, but certainly it's more difficult to advance a disparate impact a theory under IDEA than it is under Title VII. And again, that's more of a reflection of 
about the uh, biological realities of the aging process, which is just a fundamentally different distinction than we see with gender or race or national origin or things along those lines. Okay, so let's get, get a definition of this RFOA that we've talked about several times. These may include any requirement that does not have an adverse impact on older workers, as well as those factors that do have an adverse effect upon older workers, but also have been shown to be job related. And again, this is different than Title VII. Under Title VII, we have that business necessity idea, which is quite a bit more uh, demanding requirement. So uh, here we have again, <laughs> the RFOA standard is less demanding of employers than Title VII's business necessity. The disparate impact exists when a policy or rule of an employer, though not discriminatory on its face, in other words, its words don't include any kind of discrimination, but that that policy has an, as a, a, a more strong negative impact upon one group than another. Okay, so let's consider Bob's situation here. Bob, 62, applies for a job at the Perch Fishing Company. The company has concerns that applicants over the age of 40 will not be able to handle the strenuous nature of the job. As a result, it implements a requirement that all applicants have 20-20 vision. But it doesn't do this because it thinks that they need to have 20-20 vision in order to do the job. No, this is their attempt to weed out older candidates who won't pass this test but these older candidates might very well easily be able to handle the strenuous nature of the job. In his lawsuit, Bob will most likely assert a disparate impact claim because 2020 vision is not necessary for the job, but seeks merely to screen out older candidates. So that's how that plays out under those circumstances. Now, if perch fishing had instead required some kind of job sample, where the, the applicants would have to show that they could actually perform the strenuous nature of the job, assuming that the sample has been validated, that would have been a much better path for perch fishing to undertake. Um, again, statistics are something that we see pretty regularly in disparate impact cases, and it, and it doesn't mean you can't use them in an age case, but there is a fair amount of skepticism about it because again, people leave the work environment, you know, um, when they get to a certain age and people lose some of their skills as they get older. So it's not that surprising that somebody who's 80 years old might be retiring. It's not that surprising someone's 80 years old may not be up for a demanding job. And so therefore, um, statistics aren't as useful in under IDEA as they may be under Title VII. So here's a way to kind of think about these two categories, the disparate treatment side we've talked about before and the disparate impact side. I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time thinking about this slide 47. It can help you make a little bit more sense out of the ins and outs of the two theories that we have. Uh, the answers are a little bit different under um, IDEA than they are under Title VII. So spend, spend a few minutes thinking about this uh, Right. We already talked about no mixed motive cases under IDEA. Let's go through the affirmative defenses that exist for employers. Um, so what is an affirmative defense? Uh, we've talked about this before, but let's just take a second to uh, talk, a, talk a bit more about this. An affirmative defense is when the burden has shifted to the defendant. You know, we've talked about how um, there's been burden shifting under the prima facie case uh, presentation. Um, under Title VII, but we said there isn't burden shifting under the prima facie case framework under IDEA. But that doesn't mean that the defendant never bears the burden of proof, because for affirmative defenses, the, the defendant has the burden of proof. He or she has to prove by a preponderance of the evidence any particular affirmative defenses that might exist. So a BFOQ continues to be an affirmative defense. The employers continues to bear the burden of proof for that under IDEA. A bona fide a seniority system would be a similar situation. I'm not going to talk a lot about BFOQs. It's the same idea that we see under um, sex discrimination or um, you can't have a BFOQ under race discrimination, but religious discrimination. 
this could uh, come up when if there's a law that says you have to be under a certain age to do a certain thing maybe be an airline pilot or the licensing FAA doesn't permit licenses of a certain type for certain people at a certain age that would be an example of a BFOQ you can have a valid compulsory arbitration agreement again those are very enforceable in Texas um, if you had good cause for taking the action uh, for example uh, lots of tardies poor job performance you can offer voluntary early retirement incentives the important thing here is that they be truly voluntary we've already talked about reasonable factors other than age you can have voluntary and knowing waiver of rights and we'll talk more about that uh, when we talk about the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act this act is an amendment of the IDEA and we'll talk more about this in more detail this is an important difference between Title VII and ADEA. We talked about the executive exemption. Again, the, the senior executives who are getting a pension of at least $44,000, they can have a mandatory retirement age of 65. And we talked about how public safety employees are not always covered. Um, bonafide occupation. Oh, I actually, you have a slide on this one. I apologize. I forgot about this one. Um, so, uh, Many times courts are more open to a more expansive meaning of the BFOQ. Um, an employer's proof of a bona fide occupational qualification under a DEA is slightly different and less exacting than under Title VII. Title VII requires that the employer demonstrate that the essence of the business, the, the heart of the business, requires the exclusion of the members of a protected class, and all or substantially all members of the class are not able to perform adequately in the position in question. That's more than what we usually see for um, BFOQs. Let's just see what the standard is for BFOQs under ADEA. An age limit is reasonably necessary to the essence of the employer's business. So reasonably necessary is a little different than all or substantially all members of the class are unable to perform adequately. All or substantially all members of the individuals over the age are unable to perform the job, adequate, ad, job requirements adequately. So this one tracks very closely with other language. Some of the individuals over the age possessing a disqualifying trait that cannot be ascertained except by reference to age. It may be a difficult thing to test for. For example, testing for emergency conditions. I mean, how do you uh, simulate uh, an, an urgent situation that everyone is going to act as if they actually are in the urgent situation? You know, imagine uh, you, you want to test to see an airline pilot, how will he or she handle when the engine fails in flight? Well, no matter what simulation you have, you're not, the, the, the pilot knows he's not going to die or she's not going to die. And so you cannot completely replicate that circumstance. And that could be an example where you might need to have some kind of a surrogate for that level of stress. Let's consider the Western Airlines versus Criswell case. Must an employer show, what must an employer show to support a BFOQ based upon safety concerns? Again, this is a BFOQ of age. We'll, we'll say an age BFOQ. And age BFOQ. So these were airline flight engineers. So they were in the cockpit. They were not the main pilot. And they were compelled to retire from this airline at the age of 60. But at the age of 60, they were still permitted by the FAA to have the pilot's licenses required for the position um, if they pass the medical examination. So the plaintiffs are saying, listen, the AD FAA thinks we're safe to have this role, so we should be able to continue. This airline should, should be required to let us continue in our role. But the employer says, we just want to be super safe. We want our passengers to be super safe. And we recognize that a pilot of, or some pilots at 60 and 61 and 62 may be able to pass for the FA, but their uh, re, uh, reaction time may be delayed or their vision may not be quite as sharp uh, or they may not have quite a steady hand. And so uh, the employer kind of wanted to be more safe than the FAA requires. At, at trial, there were experts that kind of went both ways. Some said, yeah, this is a sensible thing to do to actually have a more demanding standard in the FAA. Others said, no, you can have some kind of testing mechanism uh, that individually evaluates each one of the individuals. The U.S. Supreme Court sided with the employees. It said the employer, 
in this, in this case, Western Airlines must conduct individual evaluations of the employees based upon their merits and not their age. So they're not allowed to have that blanket 60 because some people at 60, yeah, probably shouldn't be uh, acting as an airline flight engineer, but there probably are some people at 60, 61 and 62 are able to perform that job. And so there ought to be an individualized consideration. Remember I started my presentation time about individualized consideration. Well, this is a, a return to that idea. You don't need to know the name of the case, but you need to know the concept of the case. So IDEA specifically excludes bona fide occupational uh, retirement options that distinguish employees based upon age. So you can have um, an option that includes age as a uh, calculation method. And in fact, most of the time, you will find retirement packages do have that. You know, oftentimes it's years of service, plus the employee's age, and this, that number is somehow put into an, in a calculation to get a, an overall number. Also, another thing that happens is that even somebody who has lots of years of experience, maybe who came to work for this company when they were very young, may not be eligible to retire, even though somebody who has less years of experience is, simply because they haven't hit a certain birthday, maybe the 55th birthday, maybe the 60th, maybe the 65th. Um, these laws are not considered, or these, these rules are not considered subterfuge under the act. It is perfectly lawful for employers to have employment options, excuse me, retirement options that consider age as a factor. Also, bona fide uh, voluntary retirement options do have to truly be voluntary. Um, just using the word voluntary doesn't necessarily make them voluntary. The issue is would a reasonable person, given all of the circumstances, have felt like, gee, I have a, a legitimate option here. So for ex I'll give you an example of how that might not play out. If an employer were to say, well, we're having a, a voluntary early retirement plan, and then we're going to follow it, follow it with a RIF, and we're going to give much less good benefits under the RIF, and an employee might think, well, gosh, if I don't take this voluntary package, I think I'm going to be rift and I'm going to get less money. So yeah, I'm taking it. And yes, it's technically true. I don't have to take it, but it, I don't feel like I have an option. Under those circumstances, the employee could argue that it's not truly voluntary. Let's talk about the same actor defense. We've talked about this idea under Title VII, but there's an important difference between how we approach this issue under Title VII and how we approach it under IDEA. Um, the, uh, there is an inference under IDEA that if the same person hires you and then fires you, that the age was not a motivating factor. The idea is, well, why would the person have hired you when, I mean, obviously that person knew at your approximate age at that time. And so the idea they would turn around and fire you when obviously you're the same age, I mean, you may be older because a few years have passed, but you're uh, in the same circumstance. And so the law says the assumption is going to be that that wasn't the reason. Now it's an inference, it can be rebutted, there could be special circumstances. For example, the, the person who hired you may not be a bigot, but maybe his boss be, is a bigot, and so his boss is pressuring the manager to fire you. That could be an example where the same actor uh, uh, inference does not hold water. Now that inference is not as strong under Title VII. It's still powerful evidence. I mean, if I hire Bob and Bob is African American when I hire him, and you know, given his physical appearance, it's obvious he's African American, and then six months later I fire him, it's going to be hard for Bob to argue that I suddenly became a bigot during those six months. Or if Mary is a woman when I hire her, and she's still a woman when I fire her six months later, it's going to be hard for Mary to successfully argue that I became a sexist in those six months. So uh, it's still good evidence, but it's not a, as much of an automatic, no way around it, or limited ways around it, as we have under IDEA. Let's consider this scenario. Bob was hired as a software engineer by uh, Mary Smith. He was 46 at the time that he was hired. He worked for the company for five years, so now he's 51 years old, and he's terminated by the same person, Mary, for poor job performance. 
In this situation, Bob files a claim of age discrimination. Hey, I'm 51 years old. I feel like it was my age, not my performance. Well, since Mary hired him at 46, recognizing that, of course, he would continue to age, um, the same actor defense is likely to apply, and Bob is probably going to be out of luck under those circumstances. Okay, so let's consider this scenario. Um, this is actually not a U.S. Supreme Court case. It comes out of the Ninth Circuit. As you probably know, the Ninth Circuit is a more liberal circuit than what we have in Texas. We're in the Fifth Circuit, but still this is a case that you'll hear uh, mentioned from time to time. Let's consider the issue. Is an employer using a pretext when it hires a much younger, comma, inexperienced candidate over an age-protected, experienced candidate? Older workers um, oftentimes feel that this is what's happening, that they are being uh, treated as if they are, quote unquote, overqualified for the job. Um, it, 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 isn't that kind of expression, or at least some would argue that kind of expression might be subterfuge when what, the, what that employer is really saying is we don't want an old worker. In this particular situation, the ad said that what the employer wanted was someone with a BS and two years of experience. Well, um, the, the uh, plaintiff in this case, or the EOC was actually the plaintiff, but the EOC was representing Mr. Pugh, he had 30 years of experience. So you would think, well, gosh, 30 years is even better than two years. And I'm guessing that Mr. Pugh had the uh, BS as well. But instead of Mr. Pugh getting the interview, four younger candidates with less years of experience were selected for interviews. Of course, so Mr. Pugh filed a charge, and the, the insurance company came back and said, well, the reason we didn't hire Pugh was because he was overqualified. Um, and then when it, when it got to trial, they also said, well, his application was unprofessional in appearance. I don't know, maybe there were typos or something. And that he had a background, the particular aspects of his 30 years of experience weren't as good a fit as the other candidates. Um, so what the court found was it was okay what the employer did. Um, it was okay. Mr. Pugh was out of luck. Let me, just for the sake of argument, make the argument that the employer could have that overqualified is not as qualified as, as, uh, as somebody who has the right amount of qualifications. So imagine that you're an employer. You want to hire somebody who's going to be around for a while, who's going to be happy in his or her job. If somebody, though, has skill sets well above what uh, that person really needs in the job, uh, one of two things may happen. Um, one thing may happen is that this person may continue to look for a position that's more appropriate for this person's skill set. Imagine for, let, let's think here, let, let's say that we have a, um, a, an opening for a sixth grade science teacher at a middle school. And the person who applies has a PhD in particle physics and has uh, taught at MIT and Caltech and has just tons of credentials in that area. And also has, you know, a certificate to teach in middle schools in Texas because 30 years ago he had or she had uh, acquired this credential. And so he or she applies for the job because he or she was laid off from their job at Caltech or whatever. Well, that middle school might think in some level, well, gosh, this person would be amazing for this particular job. But it's hard to believe they're going to be happy teaching the middle school. They're probably having their resume going out to, you know, universe, UTD and SMU and UNT and lots of other colleges. And they might well, you know, ditch our job in the middle of the year or at least after only one year of employment. And then we're back to finding another person for this job. And so they might be concerned about whether this person's really going to stay. Another concern might be that this person might be just so frustrated. Uh, they're used to dealing with very sophisticated ideas. They might find it very boring to deal with, you know, the usual things you have to deal with with sixth graders. So that could be a sec second concern. A third concern could be that this person, because of the excellent knowledge this person has, might teach above the skills of these students. You know, having that 
experience working at a very high level uh, may make it more difficult for that teacher to bring it down to an appropriate level. And so most likely a court would say, yes, it's okay for that middle school to hire, you know, somebody who's much less impressive on paper than that MIT slash Caltech professor uh, for the science course. You do not need to know the name of this course. But again, the idea of it is, is uh, something that you do need to have. Okay, so if an employee has agreed to arbitrate his or her employment claims, usually, as we said before, that arbitration clause will be enforced. Let's talk about the issue of class actions. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time in this class talking about class actions. They certainly are a source of great concern for employers for lots of reasons, uh, but they're kind of beyond the, the uh, scope of this particular class. Um, typically in Title VII, um, we, well, okay, let me just tell you, during the, the, the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure that relates to class actions is Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23, and it goes through the four things you need for class actions. Um, but there are two ways, and you look to the statute to see which one of these applies. There are two ways of deciding who's going to be in the class. And under Title VII, there's one way of it. You, you follow one rule, and under um, uh, uh, IDEA, you follow another rule. And in fact, the, the second rule, the IDEA rule, is also the rule for FLSA. So we see both of these rules in the areas of employment discrimination. And the rule for IDEA is that potential plaintiffs have to opt into the class. The rule for Title VII is the potential plaintiffs have to opt out of the class. So you may say, what, what does that mean? Why do we care about this? Well, what it means as a practical matter for employers is that you much prefer an IDEA class action to a Title VII class action because you're going to have a lot fewer plaintiffs. The plaintiff has to say, or the potential plaintiff has to say, hey, you know what? I want to participate in this. And so they have to actually tell the court, yep, I, I want to, to sign up. Now, potential plaintiffs are notified about it, and then they have to do something. And if they don't do something, they are not going to be part of this class. Um, as a practical matter, most people aren't going to do anything. And so most of the people that could have been a member of the class are going to, you know, either maybe the, the letter never arrives to see them or they thought it was junk mail or they opened it up and go, eh, this doesn't really affect me. Uh, they just don't act on it. Um, the, the, so, so you're going to see a smaller class when you have an opt-in rule than when you have an opt-out rule. Uh, Title VII is an opt-out rule statute, and what that means is that everyone who potentially was affected is going to be presumed to want to participate in the class action unless they actually notify the court and say, you know what, Your Honor, this isn't for me. Well, it's very rare for somebody to opt out. In fact, about the only time people opt out is if they happen to have their own separate lawsuit. And um, so what you find is that virtually anyone who could have been affected is going to, you know, even kind of through no action of their own, opt in just because that's the default setting. So you typically have a much larger class when you have an opt-in an opt-out statute than an opt-in statute. And so that's for that reason, a Title VII class action is much more concerning to employers than a, um, a DIA. But of course, employers never won't like class actions. They are much more expensive to litigate. The potential damages are dramatically larger. The odds of adverse publicity and notoriety associated with it are also significantly increased. So it's in kind of an all ways or shapes and forms, not a good situation for employers. So IDEA class action may be less intimidating than Title VII for employers, but it's not a happy piece of information under either scenario. So we have completed our first four topics in this module, in, in, our, excuse me, in this lecture. In our future lecture, we will cover uh, the remaining topics. We'll talk more about RIFs 
um, within the, uh, the, the topic of age discrimination. We'll talk about retirement, both mandatory and voluntary incentives. We'll talk about the Older Worker Benefit Protection Act, which is a really different thing that we have for age discrimination that we don't have for Title VII claims. We'll talk about harassment and retaliation. Of course, those are still valid claims under uh, ADEA, just as they are under Title VII. We'll discuss remedies, which are somewhat different um, when we say damage, remedies, you might think damages are somewhat different for uh, ADEA plaintiffs than for Title VII plaintiffs. And we'll talk about ERISA, which is employee benefits, which kind of relates back to retirement to some extent. Uh, so thank you for your attention. As always, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. Send me an email. My email is cgroover at colin.edu or better yet, come stop by and see me. I would love to talk in more detail about these topics. Um, and so I look forward to hearing from you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening and I hope you enjoy the next lecture that we'll be having over um, age discrimination. Thanks so much for your attention. Bye-bye.